Good morning. We're live, Adam. Hey, good morning. Good morning, brother. Uh, this is a Friday morning edition of Coffee with Rich here at the American Warrior Show, which is the podcast of the American Warrior Society. If you want to know what the American Warrior Society is, please check, check out today's links in the show notes. Or if you want to check out Adam Boyce's website, you can find that as well. Let's talk about some sponsors real quick because our sponsors are amazing folks that do good things for our community. And they're also the ones that pay for Coffee with Rich to be on the air. So let's thank them. Starting with my good friends over there at APPHemp.com. That's Appalachian Standards, makers of the finest CBD products money can buy. They are artisan hat craft hemp growers. And they are growing some great products in the mountains of Asheville, North Carolina. They actually do everything from the seed to the end product. So there's no middleman involved. They're amazing folks doing wonderful things. If you're like me, you've been rolling on the mats and doing crazy stuff for the past 30 plus years, and your joints are, uh, are not too happy about that, take some of the CBD products from Appalachian Standard, and I promise you, you will feel the difference after about 30 days or so. A couple drops under the tongue at night, and uh, you'll thank me for it. The links to all of our amazing sponsors can be easily found by going to AmericanWarriorShow.com. I've got a link for you in today's show notes, and uh, you can find all the discounts there. Mountain Man Medical, man, I've to say this again and again. I'm going to slap the table on it today. Christmas is right around the corner, folks. It'll be here next week. It's probably not too late to order a trauma kit from Mountain Man Medical. We've got the co-branded American Warrior Society trauma kit with everything you need in it to keep you and your family safer, not just through the holidays, but throughout the year. Also, I have Precision Holsters, man. John and the boys over at Precision Holsters are making quality products. I got the Ultra Appendix that I carry every single day. Took my G26 into it. Won't leave the home without it. As well as the Tactical Belt, which is amazing. High-quality gear. If you're into competitions, like Mr. Mike Seeklander and most people watching today, Check out their competition line. The fast holsters are absolutely amazing. And we also have Century Martial Arts. Century Martial Arts makers of the Bob XL, that body opponent bag, that big strike dummy that you always see Mike punching around on. But you can also shoot Bob. You can put him in a gi top and strangle Bob. Bob doesn't mind. He's an absolutely indispensable training tool. Last but not least, Cool Fire Trainer. Cool Fire Trainer, man. Why dry fire? That's so like. 1970s why dry fire when you can cool fire all you got to do is replace the barrel and the recoil spring and you get felt recoil one of the downsides of dry firing all the time is that grip can loosen up not with a cool fire because every single time you're going to get felt recoil and you're going to have to hold on to that handgun and it's going to fly to your hands if you haven't seen one before please check them out We've got a discount code for them as well let's see who we got on this morning adam we got on Jesse from Michigan, coin number 2221. If you want to find out what a coin number is, find out if becoming a member of the American Wear Society is the right thing for you and your loved ones. Check out the links in today's show notes. Greg is on. Good morning, Richard Adam. Good morning, AWS. Greg Drum, uh, Texas 2060. My good friend up there. And uh, he says, good morning, gentlemen. Two great men on today. Yeah. Akeen is on. He says, good morning, all. Good morning, Akeen. Alan is on from Free Virginia, coin number 1571. Will out there in Montana. Corey is on. John Traver, please like and hit that share button, folks. We are just getting started. I'm going to read Adam's amazing bio, and then we'll get on with today's show. Adam is an authorized instructor of Marshall Blade Concepts and one of only a handful of MBC instructors in the entire world who travel and teach MBC seminars. Adam's previous career experience has included being an assaulter and sniper on a special response team for nearly seven years, following which he has spent the remainder of his career working in the training department for a government agency. He is a defensive tactics instructor, firearms and advanced weapons instructor, and knife designer. He has multiple years training in a variety of martial arts and self-defense systems. He earned a Bachelor's of Science from Idaho State University in training and development with an emphasis on adult learning and is fluent in Spanish. 
A perpetual student of self-defense, Adam is continuously looking for and testing the best self-defense methods and practices. Adams believes the best instructor are those that continue to learn, and you can find Adam not only teaching others, but attending multiple seminars taught by other instructors throughout the year. Matter of fact, I think that's where I first met you, Adam, at a Marshall Blade Concepts seminar out in Colorado. That's right. Yeah, 2016, I think. Yeah, many years ago. His career experience make him a, a natural fit for training law enforcement and military in which he excels and loves. But Adam's true passion is helping people of all ages, sizes, and physical capacities gain critical skills and knowledge to defend themselves and the ones they love as an instructor he follows the nbc credo you don't have to fight like me you just have to fight well welcome to the show adam thanks rich honor to be here true honor yes yeah, an honor to have you brother hey so what does that bio overlook man um yeah i think you've kind of hit everything with that uh probably the biggest thing with it is is just i love training and i love helping others um that's probably my biggest take is that that this is kind of my hobby. Um, a lot of guys do the snowmobiling and dirt biking and stuff, but this is what I do for fun. So that's kind of my life. <laughs> yeah, I think at some point, it, uh, you know, if this is your life, it, I'm the same way, Adam. I, mean, I don't have any real hobbies other than, you know, drinking coffee and snarky comments, I guess. But <laughs> yeah. But, I, you know, I've never been into fishing, hunting or any of that stuff. I just I, I think it's more practical for me to spend my time on the mats or on the range or whatever. Yep. So let's get let's dig into this, man. How did you end up becoming a training junkie? And I say that with all the love and sincerity I can muster because uh, you are part of our community. You know, whether there's people watching today on, on the live show or listening to us on a podcast, they're probably training junkies like us, man. How did that how did that come about? Um, I would say probably began um, when I was about 12 years old. I lived in a little city called Grant, Idaho, really small city. Um, there weren't very many people, but there was three boys that came to the gas station that was about 100 yards from my house. Um, this gas station was one I frequented every day. I would go buy candy as a kid. Uh, they ended up murdering the lady. They shot her in the back of the head. She was a good friend of mine. So I this is a location where there weren't a lot of people. And if this could happen here in this small little community, that violence could occur like this, I knew it could happen anywhere. And I wanted to figure out how to make that not possible to happen to me or anybody that I love. So that's kind of what kicked me off on the self-defense uh, world. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so that's kind of my personal experience. Uh, another situations I had, I lived in Guadalajara, Mexico for a couple of years. And while I was there, I had a gun pulled on me and a knife pulled on me. And just kind of that experience is like, man, this is not something I enjoy. And if it happens again, I want to be able to, to be victorious if that's the case. So, Yeah. I had a, a similar things that led me into this, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, out of necessity. Uh, it, it's interesting how some people come to this community, you know, some people come to this community because they golf every day or they golf on the weekends. And one of the golfing buddies is a shooter. And, and then they take up, uh, the shooting sports as more of a, of a hobby and they, they feel very uncomfortable shooting at humanoid targets. Maybe they've never had any kind of physical confrontation. So for them, it's, it's an extension of the golf or whatever kind of uh, sporting pursuits they've enjoyed. But I think for you and I, and maybe some of the other folks watching or listening this morning, you know, it was out of necessity. Yeah. Agreed with that. Yep. As far as uh, grappling, man, uh, where are you at on your grappling journey? Oh, so I started grappling about 2007. Um, the reason I started it, uh, we had uh, some banter, friendly banter going on when I was on SRT. And and one of the guys snuck up behind me and, and gave me a what he thought was a naked choke and messed my jaw up pretty good. And it was like, man, I got to learn how to defend against this type of an attack. So I started going to jujitsu. I've been off and on since, like I said, 2007. Um I'm, I'm always kind of considered a white belt. That's where I will always be with jujitsu. There's just always so much to learn with it. Um, no geese kind of my thing. I like doing the, the weapon grappling is, is where I focus my attention. And in that, st that, uh, stance, I'm, I'm lucky to have a fantastic mentor and trainer, uh, Jeremy Shive. Uh, so yeah, we get to do that every week and it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I do both key and no gi, And I gotta say, i not a fan and I'm not a fan of no gi. I love, I guess as an older, slower guy, I love having the ability to latch you know, on. Yeah, bro. Yeah. Latch on and slow it down. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, that's yeah. that's what I like about the no gi is it's, there's the like you say with the gi you can grab on, you can latch on, you can hold on. There's more chokes with it, obviously. Um, but yeah, I like the the dynamics of crap. There's nothing to hold on to here. I gotta make this work. Yeah, it's it's true. I, I will say though that people that do no, I think you got to do both because you do. Uh, yeah, you could. Because the gi guys can come in and get wrecked in the, in a no gi, and the no gi guys and gals can come in and get wrecked with a gi. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Now, as far as martial blade concepts, of course, that's Michael Janish's system, and you and I met there probably five years ago. Yeah. How did you get into that? So that's kind of an interesting situation. So I was a defensive tactics instructor, and I was sitting in the back of the room uh, while we were teaching a new class of officers. And a gentleman walked in and he was, he's kind of observing and I didn't know who he was at the time. And I asked him if he had any questions. He's like, no, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, you know, I'm all right. So anyway, got to talking to him and he's a uh, kind of one of the directors of our agency. I didn't know him at the time. And he's like, Hey, do you know anything? I said, well, yeah, I do a little bit of Muay Thai and some jujitsu and a couple other things. And but I said, I'm really interested in some knife stuff. That's where I'm really focusing my attention right now. And he's like, well, I'm going down to this camp, this martial blade concept camp. When I come back, I'm going to need a training partner. So we kind of hit it off from there and started training like five days a week. And it's been a fun journey. Um, and part of the reason I jumped into the knife stuff and why I was interested into it is, is when you look at it from the, the law enforcement standpoint, a lot of the techniques we were using, when you put pressure under it, it was like, man, that's not going to work. Um, you know, the, the figure four from over the head or an arm bar takedown. Some of those just when you applied pressure weren't working so great. So I was lucky to find Wash Blade Concepts. Um, as you know, Mike Janich is a, a genius when it comes to this stuff. A lot of this is really well thought out. And that's kind of what attracted me to the system was the, the legal aspect of it. And then also the funk, the, the, the simplicity of it. So that's so, kind of what got me on. Yeah, speak to, if you could, Adam, the legal aspect of it. Because, uh, you know, I taught edge weapons in the Marine Corps through, uh, when I was a close combat instructor. And the way we did edge weapons there was grossly different than his uh martial blade concepts can you speak to the why it's more legally appropriate for a civilian defender yeah absolutely so again because of the way that we target things so if you look at uh, most systems it's like i'm going to stab you or i'm going to cut you across the throat um, most people when you say hey here's a knife how are you going to use it they're going to say well i'm just cut him across the carotid artery and he's going to bleed out um, but there's a couple problems with that is number one when you look at that from a self-defense situation, if you cut somebody across the neck, there's no other alternative, no end point other than death. If you cut someone across the neck, it's not, I'm trying to stop him. I'm, I'm trying to kill him. Um, so what Mike Janish does with NBC is he looks at how do I stop somebody? What is the best stopping power I can apply with a knife in the situation that I can stop an attacker as quickly as possible? So what he's done is he's broken it down into basically uh, three main components is number one, they can cut the flexor tendons. So if I can cut your flexor tendons, that basically limits your ability to hold on to a weapon. If I can cut your bicep or tricep, that limits your ability to extend the arm. Or if I can cut the quadricep, that limits your ability to sustain weight or to stand up. So with those in mind, with our targeting system, um, you're looking at how do I stop somebody as efficiently and quickly as possible versus how am I gonna kill somebody? So if you ever have to use a knife for self-defense, which is a, is a horrible day. Um, but if you do, you can articulate the reason I cut him across the wrist is I wanted him to stop. He dropped the knife, the fight's over. So again, from a legal standpoint, when you're looking at it, I didn't stab him 52 times and wait to him bleed the unconsciousness. I cut him across the wrist. He dropped the knife. The fight was done. Yeah. That, that, when I heard that, um, uh, that first time I went to Marshall blade camp, I was like, I'm in, you know, this is, this yeah. is what makes sense to me. And, and of course, Michael Janich, uh, you know, works for Spotter Co. Here is one of his uh, signature products, the uh, Yojimbo 2, which don't leave home without it. But it's purposely, <laughs> it's purposely built with Michael's system in mind. Um, and of course, you have your own knife we can talk about, but it, it's a very similar knife, right? Yeah, yeah, pretty similar. So if you kind of take a look, uh, here's the knife I designed. Like I say, it's a similar from the standpoint, there's my camera here, similar from the standpoint of a worn clip design. Mm -hmm. um, the reason for that is when you look at a knife selection, there's a few different things you need is number one, you need to be able to hold on the knife. So if I design a knife or I have a knife that I can't grip really well and hold on to, it doesn't do me any good. I need to be able to cut and thrust effectively. And then I need to be able to manage impact shock. So if I was to use this knife, I don't want to thrust in and then have my hand slip forward and cut my own fingers. Yeah. 
Um, so that's kind of the design idea behind this is if you look at the grip, number one is it puts me in what we call the Filipino grip. So I can naturally grab it that way. Uh, the knife design, when you look at Warncliffe, um, so if you look at the Yojimba like you're talking about with Janich, it's kind of got that straight edge. So basically think of like a box cutter on steroids mm -hmm. is the idea behind the blade. Um, most knives, if you look at design, will have a little bit of a belly to them or a curve. Mm -hmm. So when you go to cut with them, it will just kind of glance or slide off. Whereas something with a straight edge like this, like a, a box cutter, when you apply pressure from the heel of the blade all the way to the tip, it will dig in deeper and actually make a more devastating cut. Um, additionally, from a thrusting standpoint, if you do have to thrust in, what will happen is it acts almost as like a ramp and it will expand and push that blade in deeper um, with all the testing that we've done. So that's kind of a general idea or basic idea of why we like the Warncliffe and, and why it's designed that way. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, if you watch any of the, to go back to the, the legal side of the Marshall Blade concepts and the things that you teach in your seminars, you know, if I, as you said a moment ago, Adam, you're like, hey, you know, if I stab you 52 times and I'm waiting for you to lose conscious, that's yeah. the exsanguination, the blood literally draining out of your body. You got a lot of fight in you, man, as you're slowly, I may have, I may have killed you in the, the initial blow, but I'm going to have to fight you for the next several minutes as I wait for exsanguination to take, take hold. Whereas uh, Michael Janich's system, and I, 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 I'll give a testimonial to it, a uh, buddy of mine that I do jujitsu with, some, Hey, Matthias. He uh, was out there chopping with a machete and he's reaching up and grabbing branches and then would chop with a machete and he's reaching up and grabbing branches and he got distracted and he just had a glancing blow of the machete across the back of his hand. Yep. And he thought, ow, that hurt, but I guess I just smacked it. And he reached up to grab more branches and the hand wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. And he's like, my hand's not grabbing. And he looked and he had a gash and it had cut all those tendons on the back of the hand and the hand would not work. Yeah. So you, you base it off of that. And that's kind of the, the interesting thing is when you start analyzing, start looking at knife attacks, like you're saying, time-wise, stabbing and waiting for some to bleed to unconsciousness takes a long time. So if you base it off of the numbers, based off of uh, uh, surgeons and trauma doctors, um, or even accidents like in the construction field, um, you'll, you'll notice that the average adult weighs about 188 pounds. Um, and this is based off of uh, Janice's research, but the average adult weighs about 188 pounds. Um, they, their heart volume, they pump out about 98 milliliters every time their heart beats, and they have about six liters of blood in their body at any given point. So to bleed to unconsciousness, you need to lose about 30% of your blood. So if you think of like the two liter pop bottles, you basically have to lose a full volume of that to bleed um, to the point of shock. Unconsciousness is 40%. Um, so when you think about it from the standpoint, like you're saying, the carotid artery, you have about seven and a half percent of your blood flow. Um, so if I do cut somebody across the throat, um, the average adult at 188 pounds, it's going to take about three minutes and 34 seconds for them to bleed to unconsciousness at a, at a normal heart rate. Um, so like you're saying, it's a very long time if that's what you're depending on is, is someone to bleed to unconsciousness versus, hey, I cut in the clock across the flexor tendons, they drop the knife, the fight's over. So the longer you give them the opportunity, the opportunity to attack you, the, the greater chance you have of death or grievous bodily harm to yourself. And, and uh, you know, can you describe what the work product looks like? Yeah. You know, one versus the other. Yeah. Yep. hundred percent. They, they look completely different. And, and unfortunately in the United States, as far as, or anywhere in the world, um, criminals use knives. That's just kind of a given. So if you're going to use a knife for self-defense, like you're saying, you want to make sure that that, that product, your work product looks completely different than what they normally see. So again, another hats off to Mike Janch for the way he designed the system, because he's really thought through the, the process as far as why we're doing what we do. And uh, is there a place where people can pick up one of your knives, Adam? Yeah. So if they want to pick up one of my knives, it's on uh, my, my webpage, spartanmode.com. Um, I have a handful of those left. Uh, usually they sell out pretty quick, but I do have a handful left on, on my website. Yep. Okay, well, they're going to have to beat me to buy one. I don't know why I don't have one yet. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's talk about shooting, man. So uh, was shooting something that you did before you got into working in the special response team, or was that something that just kind of came with the job? Yeah, so interestingly enough, I'd never really shot in a handgun before I got on as an officer. Um, I was kind of a uh, – I didn't, didn't really grow up around them. Um, so then I got on a, as an officer and then a year later I tried out for the special response team. Um, once I got on there, I tried out and got on the shoot team. 
I just started applying a lot of effort. Luckily for me, I had a couple of fantastic mentors in the training department that helped me out. Um, yeah, I've been shooting since about 2007. So in the long scheme of things, not a long, long time, but, uh, yeah, absolutely love it. So, you know, uh, I know that you teach seminars all over the country, maybe all over the world. I'm not sure how far your reach is. I know it's pretty doggone deep and, and you're currently, uh, an instructor. What makes a good instructor? So I think the biggest thing is the curiosity among the instructor that they're always continually looking for. How can I do this differently? What can I do better? How do I make myself more efficient in the processes and the, the things that I'm doing? Um, probably more than anything, though, is going to be mindset and instilling the the thoughts in everybody else as far as, hey, I don't need to have this, you know, $3,000 pistol to be effective. What can I do with what I currently have? What can I do with my, what might be available to me? And again, just that, that ability to learn the, 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 the questioning attitude. Um, I think that's what makes the best instructors. Um, and that's part of the reason why I go. I try and go to four to six classes a year on my own dime just to try and keep my skills up and learn different things. And I'll go to classes from all different types of instructors. Um, but I, I think that's what makes the best instructor. Yeah. Did, was it this year that you came out or was it last year, Adam? It was last year. Yep. Last that, was year. A, that was a good class. That was a fun time. Yeah. Up in Montana. Mm -hmm. So as a guy that has spent a lot of your adult life as an assaulter sniper on government response teams, what would you say is the state of the tactical community today? If there is such thing as a tactical community? Yeah. So thinking back on it, I think there is, there's a couple different ways to look at that, but I think when you look at as far as the tactics and where they've came, they've came a long ways in the last, um, you know, 13, 14, 15 years, even from the early 2000s, when you look at the gear that was available, um, when you look at kind of the mindset of some of the operators, like this is what people do for a living. Um, this is, this is their passion. A lot of them, like we're talking, this is our hobbies. This is what we do on our days off. Um, there is also the other aspect of, of some of the kids coming in um, currently, maybe don't have some of that experience. They've maybe spent a little more of their life playing video games and that type of thing. Um, so you have a kind of a pretty broad um, variety of the officers and, and whatnot that are coming in, but yeah. So you're, you're laying emphasis on the raw human material, probably more so than equipment and tactics, or am I misunderstanding that? Yeah, I think so. I think it's uh, as far as the standpoint of um, everything that really matters, equipment's fantastic, but it's really going to be the mindset of the individual. It's really what it comes down to. Um, no, I totally agree with that. I think that uh, people lay way too much emphasis on on equipment. I mean, it doesn't matter if you got the mindset and I, I often think back to there was this one inmate when I was working in Mike and I were working in corrections. And if you look at him, he's a slender build African-American guy. Uh, I always describe him as he had the face of an angel. He just looked like the sweetest kid you'd ever see, but he had the heart of a lion. Yeah. Uh, he's also a criminal, make no mistake about it, but uh, he didn't mess around, man. And somebody insulted him in the pod. He went, he went up to a cell. He got his three number two lead pencils that they were allowed to have. He came, he comes down, asked the pot officer, Hey, sir, can I borrow the, the sharpener? To sharpen my pencils. Oh, sure. Robert, go ahead. He sharpens them up, puts a little rubber band around him, and then walks over and stabs this guy in the neck until, you know, yep. you know they had to haul him off. Um, and again, he didn't need any fancy equipment. He needed speed, surprise, and violence of action and three number two pencils. Yep. So, yeah. So off that note, I took a class from uh, Ed Calderon, Ed, Ed's Manifesto, if yep. you've maybe seen him or heard of him. I um, that was an absolute eye-opening class for me from the standpoint of, of the, the mentality of criminals um, and the, the way that they look at violence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What were some of the takeaways, if you don't mind sharing? A couple of them was don't get attached to the weapon. So mm -hmm. he's a big fan of pioneer women, a woman, uh, the knife you can buy at Walmart for $9 and 99 cents. I think's the price like I a paring knife, isn't it? It's like, it's like a paring knife. And I think he sold, single handedly sold out all the knives across the nation at Walmart because of what he's demonstrating with it. But, um, you know, again, too often we get this thinking, I, man, I need this really fancy gun or need this really fancy knife. And I've got this attachment to this weapon. And it's like, you don't need all those fancy things to be efficient. And that's the criminal mindset is they don't need a, a fancy gun or knife. They'll pick up a hammer or a kitchen knife or, 
whatever is available to them. And so um, I think too often we get in the tech world kind of get stuck on, I need this equipment when really the mindset is more important. And it's often the thing that is left less thought about and less trained. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, I was having a conversation with somebody and uh, I was talking about, I was heading over to, I don't know, somewhere in Europe a couple of years ago, right before COVID. And they're like, Hey, you know, you can't take a gun. You can't take this and that. I'm like, man, if I need a gun bad enough, I'm going to look for a weak cop and take that damn gun away from him. I mean, I'm, you know, what, there's n nothing that's going to stop me if, if I need what I need. Um, uh, Mike Seeklander is on. He says, why have you not done a seminar here, Adam? <laughs> yeah, I need to come do that, don't I? Yeah, that'd be a good time. Uh, talking, coming kind of close your way, uh, talking with Zach Wilson, we might come out and do one oh, yeah. later this year. So, yeah. That would be awesome. Zach is a freaking stud. Have you rolled right. with a, a Zach? I never have. No, we went through a firearms instructor class together. Um, yeah, we never oh, got yeah. the chance to roll, but good okay, guy. Man. Great. He's a handful. We'll, we'll get on the mats when, when you come down. <laughs> Yeah, I can't wait. That'll be good. So, so as far as, uh, you know, recently I had a guest on, I think it was TJ, and I've, I've gotten a lot of really good stuff from having TJ on. He's a, a longtime uh, police officer out in a, a department in the southwest United States, and he, he mentioned, Adam, that there's an epidemic of leadership in America. Can you relate to that at all? Yeah, um, that's that's pretty obvious, I think, from the standpoint of when you kind of look around and ask anybody, it doesn't matter their their politics, what what side of the aisle they lie on. I don't know that there's really anybody that's super happy with the way that the, the country is currently headed. Um, and unfortunately, um, you know, with the pandemic and everything that we've been facing, I think a lot of people are in a state of frustration. And uh, unfortunately, I think it's it's probably time that we step up as individuals and 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 start putting our money where our mouth is and and taking action to do things to make the country better. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm more, you know, I'm, I'm really concerned with the loss of freedoms, especially in the Western English speaking world. You know, we see what's going on in Australia. I mean, it, it, if you're watching this morning and you haven't seen what's going on in Australia, please check it out because I don't think our mainstream media is reporting the loss of freedoms that they have there and the camps that they're putting people in, you know, and, and New Zealand is perhaps maybe worse. And then here in America, you know, I, th I think we need to push back as much as we can on this loss of freedoms because once they're lost, they're not coming back. Yep. Uh, yeah, I agree with you on that. And it's, it's an unfortunate time if we're not standing up because once those freedoms are gone, like you say, it's going to be really challenging to get those. Yeah. Uh, and so this kind of leads into maybe my next question. What do most people what do most people watching today? And again, I know that we have a very discerning group of watchers. The 30 plus folks that are watching us live right now are, are one of our community. There, there are folks, Adam, of course, you know that, but what, but what do most people, our friends and neighbors not understand about the nature of violence or conflict management? So I think there's a couple aspects with that as far as conflict management and violence is number one, kind of we mentioned earlier is, is, is violence is, usually from the standpoint of, of those applying the violence that they, they're aggressive, they can use any tool that's available. But I think a bigger aspect from that, as far as the mindset goes, is too often we forget the legal side of things. Um, what can I legally apply? So let me give you an example. Uh, two weeks ago here where I live, there was a gentleman and, and I'm not going to go too many details because it's still going through uh, the court. But what happened is there was a kid in the evening, it's about 2, 1230 in the morning, and he was climbing over a fence. The individual inside the home came out, saw the kid, said, hey, I got a knife. Stop or I'm going to cut you. Um, cut the kid across the back of the leg, uh, cut his hamstrings, cut a horrific cut to this kid's leg. They end up having to amputate it a couple of days later. Um, again, there's still more details coming out, so I don't know all the details. But from the standpoint of the gentleman that took the knife and cut this kid's leg, he didn't think about the processes. Does this kid have the ability to harm me? Does he have the opportunity to harm me? Am I in imminent jeopardy? Um, people need to start thinking about when can I use force? What situations I use it? And what's the level of force that I can apply? I think that's a, a an area a lot of people could do a little better in studying and learning. Um, I know you've had uh, Andrew Bronk on your show multiple times, and I think he still does your little uh, case law of the week about a year ago. I remember hearing some of that, but uh, 
you need to start learning the legal side of this because you could do the best self-defense move in the world and you do it incorrectly or you do something that's illegal and then you're going to lose your house and you're going to lose everything that you own. So I think that should be a focus that people apply more is what is the legality of where I live, where I, where I travel. I t totally agree with you, man. Um, I think this is probably the, I don't know. Last last time I saw numbers, there was anywhere between 11 and 13 million concealed carriers in the United States. People that actually took the training, got the, the little laminated card, and then that's not counting folks walk around constitutional carry that have never taken any type of training. And and I'm not necessarily advocating training, but what I am saying is you got to read and study the law in the relevant jurisdiction that you find yourself in, whether that's here in America or in Guadalajara, if that's where you're going, because man, it, it, I don't want to spend the rest of my life in prison. I know you don't, Adam. No. Yeah. And off that standpoint, you brought up a good point as far as, you know, there's a lot of people that concealed carry. How often do you go out and train with the gear that you actually carry? Um, I've started recently uh, shooting USPSA matches from concealment with the gear that I actually wear around every day. And it's, it's kind of a little bit hard from the standpoint of, man, I'm going to go against these open class shooters and they're just going to, beat me down this it's going to be a challenge but i do it not so much for the shooting standpoint of i want to have a high score but can i manipulate my firearm can i draw from concealment can i do reloads from concealment um and i think that would be something that everybody if you carry concealed that's a great opportunity to go and try something that's going to make you uncomfortable put you under the time um, and see if you can actually run your gear the way you think you can because i think there's a lot of us that are kind of in the self-defense industry that are kind of legends in our own mind I think, oh, when the day happens, man, I'm going to be, you better watch out, but start applying it, start quantifying, start figuring out if you can actually do what you think you're going to do. And there's a lot of ways to do that. Mike uh, Sieglander says, I love that. Maybe Adam can tell folks how he carries and what he carries. Yeah. So I have a couple of different ones. Um, the one that I currently shooting um, is a Glock 19 with just a hollow sun 507, I believe is the site on it. Um, I, don't, I do think I'd have my holster here. I just, I just got done dry firing, so let me make sure this is clear. Quick. So I don't have the cool fire trainer. I'm not that cool. But uh, what I've been running practice-wise, just at home, I've been using one of these dry fire trainers or tra uh, magazines. Um, and then I have a good friend of mine. He makes a Victory Operational Works. Um, so this is the holster. I run appendix. And then I just have a couple mag pouches that I run as well. Um, as far as knives, what I carry, I obviously carry my a Goji 2. That's my number one carry. And then from the standpoint of a folder, I'll carry a Yojimbo. Trying to figure this camera out, Yojimbo 2. So that's kind of the basics of the way that I carry. And actually, interestingly enough, I'd never really shot or carried appendix until I came to Mike and Rich's class about it, what is a year and a half ago, I believe. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that's one thing I'd recommend is go take a class from Mike and Rich or some competent instructors from the standpoint of when I showed up as like, man, I want to shoot this red dot from concealment, but I haven't really ever done it before. And what a game changer to come to your guys' class and be able to learn that and under your supervision and make sure I'm doing it properly. Um, so that's, that's the big things I'd recommend with if whatever you're going to do, take class from competent instructors um, and then start applying it, start practicing and start figuring out how you can actually implement that. Yeah. And speaking of competent instructors, man, I know that, uh, at, I don't know, Marshall blade, I don't know, three, four years ago, whenever it was, you know, you saw me gooning something up. Uh, I can't <laughs> remember what it was. And you know, you're gently coming up, uh, rich, do you mind if I uh, show you something? Of course I'm looking up at you like, yeah, man, help me out here. <laughs> screwing this yeah. up. Ah, uh, you're doing good, man. <laughs> um, yeah, I got a Dan has a great point here. He says the worst competitor is probably still better than uh, than the best criminal. That and that is true when it comes to gun handling. There's, yeah, I think there's no question about that. Yep, absolutely. Good point, Dan. Yeah, I, I think just get out and do something. Tony says I hear IDPA is considering allowing uh, appendix inside the waistband. I I think Joyce Wilson would tell you, hell no, it ain't never gonna happen. <laughs> But, yeah, I did see that. I guess there is a poll going on right now. So if you're a member of IDPA, you can get on there. I think it's still open and uh, say that you'd like that to be an option. I know showing up to USPSA matches, I've had several guys back. You, you can't do that. You can't shoot from appendix and concealment. That's, But they did make that rule change a couple of years ago. Very few people do it because it is uncomfortable to, to get 
beat, but it's a lot of fun. Well, I was going to say it, it's, you know, you're not going to be competitive against people running the race gear, but guess what? What, what's more important to you being able to perform on demand in a Walmart parking lot or being able to perform on the, on the range, you know? Yeah. Yep. hundred percent. Jared is honest. Says good morning. Coin number eight and 95. So we, we talked about violence and conflict, but tell us about mindset. I love the fact, Adam, that you talked about training with the equipment that you actually carry, you know, getting out and competing with it. But what role is mindset in this whole thing of violence? Mindset's going to be everything as far as this is concerned. So when you look at the mindset is how do I live my life? Um, when I look at situational awareness, everybody talks about situational awareness to the point that it's almost cliche to say, Hey, you gotta be situational awareness. Um, so I start living my life in a, in a way I took a class from Rory Miller years ago. And yeah. it, the idea behind it was it was a situational awareness class. And so what he had us do is you'd go in a room and close the door and you'd have your eyes closed. And it's like, man, I felt the pressure from the wind. So from the, the pressure of change as the door closed. So I'm starting to be curious of my surroundings. I'm starting to look at things that are occurring and not so much that I'm paranoid and, and looking for situations where there's a bad guy going to pop up and shoot me, but what's going on around in me? Do I notice anything that's different? Um, and that mindset of being curious of what's going on in my, in my surroundings will set you up better than, than any, any other tactic will, because if you can avoid the conflict altogether, that's the best opportunity. Um, the second thing I've noticed is if you've ever done, um, for any of the viewers out there, if you've ever done any uh, martial arts where maybe you have to punch, uh, you get hit in the face, um, most guys will kind of throw punches kind of soft when they start doing stuff because they they don't want to hurt somebody. It's kind of our, our society now of not hurting people. Um, and statistically, from the standpoint of people, when they actually use violence and have to do it for self-defense, oftentimes uh, they use too little force when it's actually applicable. Um, so... Uh, I've heard multiple stories where people went to punch and their punch wasn't effective or they didn't do things because they, they trained to that method of not being able to hit hard. So you have to find a way to, to, to be violent when it's time to be violent. Dan, that is, that, that's worth the, the, the price of admission for today's show right there, <laughs> yeah. man. Uh, we're going to unpack this a little bit, Adam, because okay. uh, you said very succinctly something that I've been grappling no pun intended with how do i describe it and that is that and I've, I've said it before on another show you know when when i would have officers who got their ass kicked in a pod or something like that or an inmate assaulted them i'd say you know what were you doing we, we would go in the multi-purpose room get on the mats i'm like show me what you were doing when this happened grab me like you grabbed him or put put your hands on me like and and you're he's got these pedal soft skin hands that are just gently grabbing me and i'm like oh no as soon yeah. as I feel you, I feel your weakness. You know what I mean? And that predatory drive in me as a, as a normal, sane, lucid human being kicks up. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, your point is, is incredibly well-made, whether that's punching or grabbing, man, we need to do that with a purpose, especially if you're using it to defend yourself, but we need to train that way too. Right? Yeah. And interesting that you say that. So years ago, 2007, I competed in the grapplers quest in Vegas and I didn't didn't win this match, but I remember after it was over, the gentleman that I was going against, I had grabbed him very solidly when we started. I was very aggressive. And after the match was over, I didn't have a lot of experience. He ended up tapping me out. But uh, when we were done, he's like, man, when you grab me, I, I thought I thought the fight was over. And again, just having that aggression and it's the mindset. Like you say, if an attacker is going to attack you and they hold on to you and it's like, man, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. I'm going to eat his lunch. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. You have to go when it's time to go. Yeah. And I, I was talking to my son about this. We were working on, he's like, you know, I'm having some problems escaping side control and, and whatever. And I said, well, show me your side control. And okay. Technically it m probably was right. You know, Grant's a decent grappler and, and, you know, like, let, let me show you my version. Very similar. I'm going to modify just a couple of things. And, you know, immediately he's, he's ready to tap out. And I'm like, yep. there's subtle differences. And that is when I'm grabbing you, I'm grabbing you with a purpose. I want, I want the person I'm rolling with to know the man's got a hold of them. Mm -hmm. Now it doesn't mean I'm going to snatch it on and put the pain on all at once. I think that there's a, there's probably a, a, an argument can be made for that slight escalation and pressure that causes fear and induces panic in the person you're rolling with. Or am I making up that stuff? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and, and off that note, I saw a pretty interesting comment here from Alan Kelly on the Facebook page. It said in their police academy, 
they had to box for 60 seconds full striking uh, due to the trainees not having been in a fight or ever hit hard before. Um, that is fantastic. That kind of stuff of you'll realize how long 60 seconds is when you're fighting for your life and you're actually uh, going at it. So, yeah, good point there, Alan. Yeah, and that's true, man. It goes back to, you know, the, like you were saying, the, the raw material that's coming in. I've never been in a, in a fist fight, you know, and uh, my nose is, is askew for a reason. I got punched in the face <laughs> a lot with this pointy schnoz. Are you kidding me? People are always trying to break this thing. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't think that happens much anymore. So the, the raw material we get, whether it's in the police academy, SRT academy, the, the military uh, depots, they, they, they just haven't it been inoculated in interpersonal violence. Yep. You know, interesting that you say that. Uh, yesterday, I graduated a class of new officers for my agency. And and uh, one of the officers that was in the class is actually a, a gentleman that grew up just down the road from me. He was a couple years younger from than I were than I was. And uh, we were talking about some of our situations as a kid. And I don't know if you can see the scar here right on my nose, but he hit me in the face with a shovel when we were about, I don't know, Ooh. 10 years old. And, and I, I bit him back. So, yeah, you kind of life experiences. Uh, we don't always get them. So. You got to be yep. violent. You got to be violent when it's time to be violent, man. And otherwise, you know, the nicest guy in the room. And um, yeah, Seeklander was talking, uh, was it Wednesday morning? We was doing defensive handgun. He was talking about retaining the hand, the firearm in an entangled fight, blah, blah, blah. And it reminds me, um, we were in a Middle Eastern country and our Humvee got overwhelmed. And uh, Gunny Allgood, who's since passed on, rest, rest in peace, he had his... Uh, M9 in and in a, one of those tanker holsters right here. And this guy reaches through and grabs the tanker holster and grabs the gun. And I don't know if you've seen those, Adam, but they got this little crappy leather strap on them that's easy if a child can disengage that thing and get it out. Yeah. So Gunny clamps his hand down and just start biting chunks out of this guy's uh, <laughs> arm, man. It was a bloody, gruesome thing. Dude, had a mouthful of blood. But you do what you got to do when the, when the fight comes to you, man. Yeah. Yeah, so interesting enough off that, um, when I was on SRT, my code name was Cannibal. Um, the reason for that is when I was a kid, I we moved around quite a bit, and I ended up living with my grandparents for a time, and I was kind of the awkward um, kid. And anyway, I got in multiple fights, and my fight finisher every time was a bite, and I ended up biting a kid, couple kids, and not not good, but yeah. I love uh, it. Yeah. And it, you know, the camera doesn't do Adam justice. How tall are you, Adam? Like 6'3"? Six, uh, about six two ish, yeah, somewhere in there. Wear tall yeah. shoes, six four, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. So the fact that you had to result to biting it is pretty wild, man. <laughs> I was a little guy back then, but oh, really? Yeah, yeah. What speaking of the little guy, what what advice would you give a younger Adam coming up? Um, I would just say be open. Um, the mindset to be open. Go take classes again from competent instructors and be open to the way that they're they're giving you options to do things. Um, the other thing is, I would think is don't think that you have to do it this particular way. There's a million different ways to grip a gun. There's a million different ways to apply um, use of force. So everybody's not gonna be able to apply the same thing. So if you're, you know, five foot one, you're probably not gonna be able to throw head kicks. Um, taekwondo might not be your thing. Uh, maybe you're scrappier and jujitsu is more, more along the line. Um, but I would say try and find what works best for you for your body type, for your capabilities. And then just realize as you get older, your body's going to change and things are going to become different. Um, so being able to adjust as you age and grow and have, uh, you know, knee problems and shoulder problems and maybe start losing your sight a little bit. Just, uh, yeah, just have that that constant um, desire to grow and learn is probably the, the thing that I would encourage myself as a younger guy is just try everything. So go out and see what works for you. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I think that, uh, you know, it, it, to use the Bruce Lee metaphor, you know, you got to empty your cup before you can be filled again. And, and it's it's difficult for somebody that, you know, at my age, 52, having been around this, this, uh, the sun a few times and in this community for most of my adult life to, to, to come in and like, I'm here to learn. And I truly <laughs> yeah. am here to learn, but I mean, yeah. I'm here to learn, but I also see something. I go, yeah, that may not work. Or why are you putting your knees on the mat when you could put them on the suspect? And I, I see some things and I go, okay, I, there's a couple of things I can take away from this new training I'm going to, but there's a lot of things that probably won't work uh, as well 
when it comes time to, to apply it. Yeah. Yeah. So off of that note too, when you look at like uh, Muay Thai, for example, fantastic art. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you start looking at as far as the, the, the weapon application, okay. So we're in a, a conflict and they have a gun, I have a gun um, or I have a knife. I go up to do a Muay Thai clinch around the, the neck. So I'm going to control my throw knees. I'm exposing my waist to where the point they can grab and grapple on and grab my knife. Um, so there's a lot of, lot of things out there where you think, Hey, this will be fantastic. And then you apply and it doesn't work so good. Or like you say, yeah, maybe my knees are getting older and I can't do that anymore. So. Yeah, I had my, my 10th uh, planet jujitsu coach, Lance, great guy. But he says, uh, he knows that, I'm a shooter and stuff. And so he, but he doesn't know the extent of it. And he's like, Hey Rich, you know, you know, you, this is a good time. You could pull your gun out. He had the guy in the mountain. He kind of does like that, you know, and pointing at the guy's face. And I'm just like, no, bro. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> Why would I do that? I'm in, I'm in the mount, the guys on the ground. Why would I pull my gun and hand it to this, this guy? But, uh, or he will really like, he's like, Rich, I notice in your roles, man, you're, you're never doing any leg locks. I'd really like to see you do some leg locks. And I, after class, I'm like, bro, you'll never see me doing leg locks if I can help it because I don't have control of the suspect's hands. And he was kind of like, yeah, but what do you mean? And I'm like, never mind. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's a different mindset for sure. You know, that's one of the things when I'm doing jujitsu is um, I, I, again, I'm lucky to where I go. We, we train every Friday. And the guys I roll with are all monsters. They're, you know, I'm I'm 220 pounds, about six foot two, and I'm the small guy other than our instructor. And so it, it's a handful. And most of them are purple belts or above. They're just good dudes. And uh, I've I've been trying to work more neon belly from that standpoint of hey, I don't really want to be on my back. I don't want to be. Um, so yeah, you got to take what's there and apply it to how you're going to use it. Um, another thing I do when I'm, I'm doing jujitsu is I'll, I'll pretend if the, the other guy's not into rolling with the training knife or gun is I'll pretend, okay, this opening, he could grab my gun. He could grab my knife. So what would I do in this situation? And I still try to just play that mindset where I'm not maybe training with that individual in that particular manner. My mindset is what can they get? Can they drop an elbow on my head at this point? So, yeah. Yes. I don't know if you've ever rolled with a uh, seat lander, but Oh, uh, he, he's good about that. You know, where he trains at clinch, they are really good at, uh, if you're screwing around too long, you know, they'll slap the mat right next to your head and just kind of awesome. shake you out of it. And, and I'm very fortunate that, um, uh, my main coach, Cody Hudson at Hudson BJJ, you know, he, he's a, a current law enforcement guy and everybody in the class is law enforcement. So, it, we don't play around with techniques that that won't work. And one of the ones that we're all big fans of is neon belly. I'm telling That's you, man, awesome. if, if you're watching or listening today and you're not doing neon belly, yep. you need to fix that. Yeah. Great, great method. Yep. It is a great method because it, 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 it uh, one gets you off your back. You have the ability to engage or disengage. You can go back down into side control or you can stand up. It gives you a great line of sight. I mean, it's an incredible control position that not used enough in my opinion. So off that, let me tell you a story of a good friend of mine. So um, one of his best friends is a, a world-class Muay Thai fighter back in the day. And they went out there in Texas and a gentleman came up to him, started a confrontation. And this guy, again, he's a Muay Thai guy. And I think at the time he was a blue belt in jujitsu. Um, but the guy started fighting with him. He ended up taking the ground and was going to do an arm bar. Well, the friends of this guy that started the fight came over and kicked all his front teeth out. Oh, so, geez. So you look at it from the standpoint of this guy had the stand-up skills that he could have done a front kick or, or done anything to make some space, but he thought, I'm going to take him down the ground, do this. And and he got all his teeth knocked out of the front of his face. So, um, yeah, not, not, not the thing you want to do. I always said, man, if I had a jujitsu school, I would have signs on the ceiling that said, get off your back. <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. If you're on your yeah. back and looking at the ceiling, you're going to see, get off your effing back because, <laughs> uh, because it, 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 not every, and of course, my good friend Cecil Birch always says, you know, immediate action combatives um, out there in Phoenix. You know, not everything that works in the dojo is is 100% translatable to the street. I'm sure you'd agree with that, Adam. I do. Yeah. Yep. Mike Seeklander says, I like neon face, Rich's face. <laughs> That's why I like Mike. That's awesome. Yeah. Keep, keep, <laughs> keeping it, keeping it real. Rasmus says any advice on becoming quicker on the draw of a pocket knife? I'm always struggling with that. Um, yeah. So I would do it just like I did with a uh, firearm. So um, 
I would set up a timer and and start pacing yourself. A couple of things you can do is you want to look to be more efficient. So I don't know what kind of type of pocket knife you carry, but one thing I will do with my pocket knife is I make sure that it's in the same position every time. So it's just like my firearm uh, draw. draw. Um, with that, what I'll do is I will take my thumb and I'll drive it back behind the blade. I'll bring it up and then I will index it with the, the finger here and pull it up. So it's just a straight up motion. Um, again, economy of motion. I don't, when I draw the knife, it's the same thing as with the gun. I don't want to uh, throw it like I'm throwing a fishing line or throw it low like I'm bowling. It's just straight up into the, the fight position. And I noticed on your, your Jimbo, I need yeah. to clean that blade. It's got that. Uh, can you talk about that? Yeah, so actually the Yojimbo I carry usually doesn't have the 511 on it, but uh, there's a couple. Let me see if I can find another knife here. Um, this hey, can you explain what that is? People are looking at that. A lot of folks might be going, what in the heck is that on there? And why do you have it on there? Yeah, so if you look at this. it's an add-on product. It is, yeah. So this is uh, by 511. A good friend of mine makes it. Um, and what that does is it was based off of, you can find other knives. Like, for example, this is just a, an Emerson. Um, you can buy this. Uh, it's actually made by Kershaw, but it has this little hook on it. So the idea behind that hook is uh, Ernie Emerson, world famous knife maker back in the day, the SEALs came to him and said, hey, we want a knife that has a folder and it has a little hook on the back. So when somebody attacks us, we can take it and flip it out of their hands. Um, and Ernie Emerson's like, uh, okay, I guess I'll do that. Well, so anyway, he designed a folder that had this big kind of hook off the back of it, kind of kind of like this, but a little more aggressive. And what he found is every time he drew it out of the back of his pocket, the knife would open up. So basically what was happening is that hook snags on your pocket. And as you pull it back, it opens up the blade. So it's kind of almost like a, it's, it's a manual system that you don't have to apply other than just pull the knife straight back out of your pocket. So we call up the Navy SEALs and he's like, hey, um, is your knife opening up every time you pull it out of your pocket? They're like, yeah. So he called up the patent office and he's made a lot of money off of that little teeny idea there. But again, this is a great tool. Um, so again, this is by 511. You can pick those up. Uh, he makes them for a bunch of different spider codes and different blades. But basically what it does is you just take an Allen and you you hook it on into the eye hole right there. Um, there's some advantages to that. So number one is if you have a limited ability to grip. So maybe you have arthritis. Uh, maybe you're not as strong. Maybe you don't have the time to practice a draw. This is the fastest way to open up a, a folder because you're literally pulling out of your pocket and it opens, it opens up. The disadvantage to it is in order to open it up, I have to draw my elbow back. So if you're in a, in a fight situation where you're fighting off your back or you're in a, uh, like a elevator and you can't draw your elbow back, you have to know that, hey, I got to pull a little bit forward and out. So you have to understand the application of how to use it. The other thing is I would make sure is even if you have that hook on there, make sure that you have the ability to still open up that blade um, manually. And so on that note, let me see if I can sit back here. Can everybody kind of see my hands a little bit? We have a couple different methods. So going back to the opening systems, there's a few and I'll show you guys right now if I can stay here from the camera. So the first one we like to look at is called inertial opening. And so basically what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to rotate my wrist. I'm going to keep my elbow in. I'm going to flip my knife that way and that opens it up. Another method going back to opening up nice fast is called the thumb opening. So I'm basically just going to take my thumb here. Oh, camera's that way. I'm just going to flip it forward. So the idea is like flipping a marble with my thumb. I don't want to trace the blade around. I want to just flip my thumb forward. So that's a thumb opening. Um, there's other multiple others, but what I want to give you guys today is a simple one. So when you look at knife opening, if I'm trying to open it like this and I do 542 of these and a, a bad guy's coming to, to uh, attack me, that's not a good day. So what we like is called the two-hand opening. I'm just going to basically grab the back of the blade uh, here with this hand and then on the, the handle right here, I'm just going to flip down and push and that's a two-hand opening. So lots of different methods to open it, uh, but there's a couple. I have a close friend. He lives up in uh, Canada. His name's Paul Hunter. And one night he was out with his wife and they were going to the gas station and he was approached by a couple individuals that had a knife drawn. He drew in his pocket, pulled out a Yojimbo, flipped it open. The gentleman looked at him and put their knives away and said, have a good evening, sir. So having that ability to open your knife efficiently can send that message that, hey, this guy knows what he's doing. I don't want to play with him. Um, but again, anytime you draw a knife, there's that possibility that you're brandishing your, your weapon. So you got to make sure that it's justifiable in that situation. I hope you heard that, folks. It's not just the gun. If you pull that knife and you're not legally justified to pull that knife, 
well, guess what? You, you know, this idea, and I've said brandishing around Andrew Bronco before, and he's like, you know, most states don't have a brandishing. It's just aggravated assault. Yeah. <laughs> the minute you pull that out. Yeah. Yep. And that's a good for six to eight years in prison. And that's another thing. Going back to what you said, Adam, at the beginning of the show, I've said this when Andrew has been on the show, I'm like, you know, I've done everything from drop ordinance on people in combat to smash people in the face with the butt of my rifle and, and, and everything in between. And the reason I've, I've never spent a single day in, in prison is because it was all le lethal, not lethal, uh, justified and necessary, reasonable use of violence. Yeah. Um, and I, there was somebody being interviewed and he said, you know, I grabbed my girlfriend's arm in a parking lot and pulled her to toward me. And this happened in Georgia. And he ended up getting two years for that, just for grabbing her and taking her freedoms away and pulling him. Uh, I forget the type of law, but it was just, it was just under kidnapping. And the guy did two years in prison for that. Yeah. So uh, again, Adam, your point is well made. And I hope people have heard you loud and clear this morning. Yeah, interestingly enough, when you say that, we used to, for our agency, we used to teach levels of force. We would say, you know, officer presence all the way down the list, right? And yep. um, we've actually moved away from that. And now we're teaching uh, reasonable, reasonable objectiveness. So what would a reasonable officer do in this situation? What would a reasonable person think that is the maximum level of force that I can apply in this situation? Um, so again, going back to mindset, that's kind of where you need to be is what can I do? What can I apply? How can I do this? Um, on that note, one thing I'd recommend to you is I would go on YouTube for all you listeners. I'd go on YouTube. I'd start watching how violence actually occurs and then start thinking through those situations. Hey, if I was the gentleman that was over here that's getting attacked with this knife or being confronted, what would I do in that situation? And then what are the legal the legalities of it afterwards? Am I going to go to jail if I apply the same things that they did? Um, so start thinking through those. What if and I'm trying to figure out um, what's doable and what's not doable? Because if you ever have to do this, you don't want it to be the first time you've ever thought it through. So what's your, yeah. No, great, great point. It's funny you say that because uh, I don't know if you saw, I'm sure you probably did, Adam, that there was a, a recent uh, hit where there's uh, four guys standing outside a convenience store and somebody comes and machine guns them. Dad, did you see that? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah. Was, yep. That ambush was pretty gnarly. That's pretty, pretty gnarly. And yeah. like I told my son, I said, you know, if they had... If they had one one year in the Marine, in a Marine Corps rifle company, they would know uh, right out of the six five handbook for Marine Rifle Squad, and that is the acronym SAFE. If you're going to set in a defensive position, you need to follow this acronym SAFE. Security, you need to set out security. They had no security. Yep. A is avenues of approach. They didn't control the avenues of approach, so you you allowed this car with guys and machine guns to just roll within feet of you. And then uh, fields of fire, they didn't have interlocking fields of fire. You know, when they started getting shot, people start pulling out guns, but by then they're laying on the ground dying with a gun in their hand. Yeah. And last entrenchments, you can, you can look at that in, in the context of cover and concealment. You know, did you have any covering concealment? No, you're standing under a street light well, out in the open. And I got to believe Adam, that these, these guys, uh, we're, we're not pillars of the community. <laughs> you know right, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. They knew somebody was probably going to smoke them and they did. Well, I'm, I'm thinking back on the video. I need to watch it again. But if I remember correctly, there was a gentleman that was standing in the group and he walks into the door just before it occurs. Mm -hmm. um, I need to watch it again. But I think if I remember, he survived the attack. Yeah. He also, did. I, yeah. So again, just that little bit of maybe he was lucky to walk in, but he wasn't in the situation. Um, and off that note, off your safe, I love that. Um, there's a couple of things that I always try and tell everybody is the best fight is the fight avoided. So yeah. if, if I cannot be there at all, that's the best thing that I can do. I said that to, again, one of my jujitsu instructors, not Cody. And I, you know, he said, uh, Rich, what's the best defense? And I'm like the one you don't have to use or something like that. And he's like, what? I'm like, you know, uh, the best place to defend is one that's not being attacked. And he's like, yep. I don't even know what that means. Okay. But anyway, <laughs> we're going to do this. And I'm like, yeah. no, man, uh, the best place to defend is a place not being attacked. And if I can not be there and not be attacked, then then that's the best option. I think that's what you're saying, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm looking down here on the Facebook. I just want to answer a question here. So it's, please, I'm please. seeing uh, Rick Montana, how important is it to train ambidextrous with your weapons? Um, so that is a skill that you maybe should know how to apply. Um, 
unfortunately for most people, their support hand isn't going to be as effective as their strong hand. Um, so the way that I kind of look at knives and the way that I've been um, um, influenced is if I draw a gun, I'm going to learn how to shoot at support hand, but it's not going to be my main focus because the the probability of having me to use that support hand is probably going to be a lot less than using the strong hand. And I want to use the tool most efficiently as possible. So I would I would spend a little bit of time, but I would make my main focus of uh, the strong hand is what is what I would focus on. And that's just personal opinion. Uh, in the same way, as soon as he asked that question, I'm like, ooh, I don't. I mean, with my firearms, I do, but with a with an edge weapon, I don't know that I've done much of that at all. Yeah. So we we'll do what we call miss in NBC. We'll do mismatch leads. So it's how do I use uh, the knife with the left hand, or how do I use it against somebody that's using a left handed attack? Ninety percent of the world is right handed. Um, so that's kind of one thing to keep in mind is is any of your training, you're not going to be able to train for every possible outcome. So you want to train and use your training time as efficiently as possible and say, okay, what is the highest probability of, of attack or defense that I'm going to have to use and what has the highest probability of, of stopping the threat as quickly as possible? So, Well, and, and uh, we haven't really talked about counterblade concepts. Adam, you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so uh, counterblade concepts is the idea of, of starting empty-handed. So it's an imperfect world. Nobody really walks around the community with their, their knife or gun out. I mean, that would just be weird. Plus, you're probably going to spend some time in jail with it. So we're going to have to, to uh, think of a couple things as far as the way that we defend ourselves um, empty hand. Is Number one, if you don't see it coming, like Rich is talking about, the best fight is not to be there. If you don't see it coming, it's probably going to be a surprise. So you're going to have to base your techniques or your concepts off of instinctual movements that you can apply under under stress. Um, the big thing with that is how do I stop somebody when I'm empty handed? When I'm empty handed, how do I how do I create an opportunity to what we say in martial play concepts earn the draw? Um, when do when when can I give myself an opportunity? How can I do that? Is it a strike to the eyes? Is it I'm going to pass his arm down when he goes to attack me? Um, there's a million different ways we can do it, but yeah, we also teach aside from the knife side of it, we teach the counter blade, which is empty hand, um, get to your personal weapon or make space. So. Yeah. Thank you to the 40 folks that are still watching us and all those that are listening on the podcast. I really appreciate you being on with Adam, Adam and I this morning. Um, and of course, if you're just watching, my name is Rich Brown, co-host, co-founder of the American Warrior Society, retired Marine Corps officer, former police officer, corrections officer, special operations officer. And this morning I'm joined by my good friend, Adam Boyce. Adam Boyce is a Marshall Blade Concepts instructor, uh, spent seven years on a government SRT team doing all kinds of cool stuff. And now he's a, a, an instructor. And I, so just that brief introduction to, to qualify what we're talking about here this morning. And, and your point is, uh, can you, can you give me that, uh, the gist of that argument one more time? Cause there's a couple of things I want to hit on the, the argument from, sorry, one more time. I was yeah. just reading, uh, yep. Yeah, go ahead. So I, sorry, I was just reading a, a comment here on the Facebook thing from Gerald and he brought up a good point as far as the knives you can legally carry. Um, so for everybody that's listening, there's a, a point there. Um, there's a website called uh, Knife Up. If you go on there, it will tell you what you can legally carry in the state you're in. So there's a little note for you, Gerald, is check that out. Uh, sorry, Rich, what was your question before that? Now, it was more of a, a, a statement. You know, we were talking about, uh, you know, counter-related concepts and the fact that it, the world's an imperfect place and you don't yeah. always get to have your weapon out. You may be confronted with a weapon. And there's a couple things on that, I think, that, it, it, the the counterblade concept system that Michael Janich just put together is phenomenal. Please check that out. If you're a member of the American Warrior Society, you can go and watch those videos inside the training vault. But one of the things that I remember uh, some really high level instructors teaching me almost well 29 years ago, and that was like, if you're going to be in a gunfight, you will be shot. Okay, it's okay. It, it's a handgun round, man. <laughs> you know, I mean, they were just really like matter of fact. It's a handgun round. You're going to be okay. Uh, fight your fight. Don't stop any, any training drill we do. I don't care if somebody does get shot in the training drill, complete the drill, always complete the drill, never stop, tap, whatever. And he's like, and all your job after you've been shot and neutralize the threat is you just got to get to the hospital. Once you get to the hospital, just chill, man, let them do their thing. They're doctors. They got it from there. Um, but I think the same thing is probably true with an edge weapon. You will get stabbed. You know what I'm saying? Pre go ahead and prepare for it. You're going to get stabbed. You're going to feel the warm blood flow. 
uh, it's going to happen, uh, but you can survive it. Yeah, absolutely can survive it. And interestingly enough, um, I've, I've had the opportunity to train with a lot of people that have been stabbed and cut um, in different parts of the world or he, even here in the U.S., and almost all of them told me when they were stabbed, they didn't realize that they were cut or stabbed. They thought they were getting punched. They thought they were getting hit. Um, most situations, they don't realize that until, like you say, they feel something warm and sticky running down their leg and say, man, that's not normal. Or they go to take a step and they've been stabbed in the back and or the back butt cheek and now they can't take a step forward. Or one individual, um, he went to do a wrist tie. He went to grab the guy's wrist that was trying to stab him. The guy pulled back, cut off his bottom three fingers. Um, and then he continued to fight, was able to finish the guy. And then he looked down and was like, man, I can't grab. And his bottom three fingers, like I said, were, were cut off. Um, so that, again, that goes back to the mindset standpoint of is you don't know how you're going to respond under these situations, but the mindset of I'm going to continue to fight. You chose the term of our relationship and I'm not going to allow you to continue to do this to me or those I love. So yeah. it is, it is a mindset. It is a mindset. And that's why I think, uh, to something you said earlier, Adam, watch these videos in YouTube. Like Adam said, you know, John Korea's v videos over at active self-protection are phenomenal. Watch them, put yourself in that. And, and again, when the guy gets shot in the video, think about what you would do, uh, to the point we were making about the the uh, ambush there in, in Puerto Rico where four guys gets killed. There's the one guy, he gets his gun out, he's uninjured, but he's shooting at the carload of guys with machine guns, not behind cover. So he gets shot. And then instead of going in and getting behind cover, getting on the phone, getting help, he lays down in the pile of the bodies of his friends and, and exsanguinates and dies. But uh, Dr. T.C. Fuller is on this morning. Good morning, T.C. He says the highest probability of threat car wrecks and cardiac issues. There you go. Yeah. I, I like that he mentioned that because that is a, an area that we overlook a lot of times when we talk about self-defense is, Hey, I need this cool gun. I need this cool knife. Did you do any cardio today? Are you watching what you're eating? Are you able to keep your body healthy enough that you can fend off an attacker if you need to? I, I love that TC. Great stuff, man. So looking into your crystal ball, I want to be respectful of your time, Adam. I've had you on here for more than an hour. We got to do a round two, man. This has been awesome. Cool. Looking yeah, into your crystal ball, where do you see this nation heading, man? If you're looking in 2022 all the way to 2024, what's in front of us? Um, I think we're kind of on that verge right now where people are, like I said earlier in the show, um, there's a lot of frustration, a lot of pent-up emotions. People have been trapped in their houses for the last couple of years doing things that they feel like are against their freedoms. Um, I think we're on that verge where people are starting to kind of wake up to the, the reality that freedom is important. And I think we're on the verge of seeing something amazing coming where people are going to start saying, I've had enough and I'm going to start standing up for the things that I believe. I'm, I'm optimistic from that standpoint. Um, other people will say, yeah, no, we're headed for some really dark times. But I think we're kind of in that, that uh, call or that before, the, before everything changes to get better, it's got to get worse. So we're going to have some rough time a little bit ahead, but I think things are going to get better eventually. Yeah, and that's a shout out to a book I read recently. It's very similar to what you're saying, Adam. That's called uh, "The Storm Before the Calm," and and the the author I can't remember his name, but he makes this point that America has these cycles, and yeah. we have to go through these cycles. And we just happen to find ourselves in one of the more turbulent cycles, perhaps the most turbulent cycle that we're going to enter in. And the guy wrote it like in 2017, 2018. And he was saying that this this is what's going to come up. Of course, he didn't know about a pandemic or anything, but he he's like, the, there's social things in play that are going to make this more likely. And he was very prophetic, but he said, you know, we will get out of it. It may take till 2028, uh, but but as a nation, we'll come out of it better and stronger. And I, I certainly hope he's right. Me too. Yep. Adam, tell us about your company, your, your training and where folks can find you. Yeah. So if you want to find more about me, uh, go to my website, spartanmode.com. Um, I'm also on Instagram at spartan.mode or excuse me. Yeah. Spartan.mode is my Instagram page. Um, I try and do about one seminar a month uh, that slowed down a little bit with COVID. I canceled about 13 seminars because of COVID and some um, conflicts with what I do for a, a daily job. But uh, yeah, I'm starting to ramp those back up again. Hopefully 2022, I'll start teaching roughly one seminar a month again out on the road. Um, I also sell my knife, like you're saying. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, my good friend, Michael says the implied assumption of that book is that America has an unlimited supply of optimism. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's so true, Michael. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, so yeah, so I guess it's hard to teach your uh your seminar, your edge weapons seminar, your NBC seminar in that close proximity with another person in a pandemic. Yeah. Yep. But yeah. we're we're trying to figure things out. I think there's people at this point now where they're seeing what's going on in the country and they're like, man, I need some training. So I've been getting a lot of requests. It's time to time to amp it up again, I think. Well, again, most, most people, if you just kind of go into a store and look around, you know, uh, you'll see most men carrying some sort of pocket knife clipped to their, in their pants, but 99.999% of them have zero idea how to use it. Or maybe they don't even see it in that context. Maybe they see it as something that, they open a box with or something like that, but your edge weapon, like when I go to Europe, you know, you, you can't carry a fixed blade knife in most of the countries I go to you, you or you can't carry a lock blade knife. So I have to uh spider co, or maybe it's bird makes a really good UK legal knife that I carry when I go over there. Awesome. And that means you got to train with it too, right? Yep. Being able to open it up and, uh, and apply it. Yep. Absolutely. That's a whole different way of opening it. Yeah. All right, Adam, uh, any final thoughts before we close this morning's show out? Man, I appreciate having you on. Again, for everybody that listened today, thanks for spending your morning listening and, and, and uh, joining in. Absolutely pleasure uh, to be part of this community. So, Rich, man, love you, brother. Grateful to be on your show. Love you, man. Be safe out there, folks. And remember, the fight is coming. <laughs>